Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, Christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us. Lord, have mercy upon us. and ever-living God, who for the greater confirmation of the faith didst suffer thy holy apostle Thomas to be doubtful in thy son's resurrection, grant us so perfectly and without all doubt to believe in thy son Jesus Christ that our faith in thy sight may never be reproved. Hear us, O Lord, through the same Jesus Christ, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, now and evermore. Amen. We beseech the Almighty God to purify our consciences by thy daily visitation, that when thy Son, our Lord, cometh, he may find in us a mansion prepared for himself through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Habakkuk, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me, and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up and is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, chapter 20, beginning with the 24th verse. Glory, Glory be to thee, O Lord. Lord. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, 
and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus, Jesus saying unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Because these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Tomorrow, December 21st, is the appointed day for the church to remember and celebrate St. Thomas, the patron saint of our parish. And I've been told that it's been many a year since Thomas Day has been observed here, at least on a Sunday, and that's a shame. We ought then to think of today in a very real way as the birthday of our parish, uh, just as at Pentecost we celebrate the birthday of the one holy Catholic apostolic church. I need not remind anyone that Thomas has received more than his fair share of bad press, not unlike the many clergy and lay people who continue to dump their ridicule and scorn, rather unfairly to say the least, on St. Peter. Further, whatever Peter's sins may have been as recorded in the Gospels, they remain far more egregious than Thomas' supposed doubting. Nor can I ever forget what my first boss, uh, Tom Fitzgerald, the rector of Christ Church Frederica, said in a homily for Thomas almost 40 years ago tomorrow, um, and that is that uh, actually, tomorrow is the shortest, uh, ergo darkest day of the year. Nevertheless, come the next day, the days begin to grow longer and brighter. And perhaps then the church chose this day for Thomas because he, more than any other apostle in terms of the biblical narrative, has made it possible for us truly to see the light, capital L, in a more real way. So I'd like for us to attempt to see somewhat of a parallel this morning between Thomas' life and the life of our parish. So let's consider several things, at least reconsider them. First, John's gospel is the only one where we read anything at all about Thomas, other than his name being mentioned elsewhere. John, being the last of the evangelists to write a gospel, doubtless wanted to be sure that nothing important be left out. Further, most biblical scholars will attest that what Scott just read is the original ending of John. Chapter 21, the next and final chapter, uh, was added sometime later when John, recognizing that his colleague Peter had been so severely slandered that John believed it imperative to include something good about Peter, what has since been come, to, uh, come to be called the restoration of Peter. And just as John restored Peter's reputation in chapter 21, he also restored, if not actually established, Thomas' reputation, a very great reputation, actually, by including this passage as the original climax of his great work. Thus today, as we commemorate and celebrate our parish's patron saint, we can't help but address that glorious theological virtue of faith. We've known his story since we were children. The first Easter day, Thomas is not with the eleven when the Lord appears. And when told that he is alive, Thomas says, unless I see, myself, see for myself the print of the nails and put my hand inside, I will not believe. And millions have interpreted this as our patron saint having no faith. And to be sure, millions would be dead wrong. They even point to a moment earlier in the gospel narrative where Jesus has made up his mind to go to Jerusalem and Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. 
That line exists only in John, let us also go that we may die with him. And those who insist on Thomas being a doubter and lacking faith often say that he spoke that line in a sarcastic or cryptic manner, uh, or they ignore it altogether. You know, something like, well, let's go see what crazy old JC is up to, maybe we'll die with him, ha, ha, ha. Well, I don't believe that interpretation for a moment. Rather, Thomas knew exactly what would happen in Jerusalem, and he was ready to hitch his wagon to our Lord all the more, and perhaps, perhaps even to dive with him. That didn't happen, of course. Another dynamic at work in this scenario is that the author of the fourth gospel is none other than John, the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and there's no way the beloved disciple would purposely humiliate a brother like Thomas, uh, well, other than Judas, whom with good reason John quite rightly despised. Nor would he have included the end of the Thomas saga unless John had a very good reason. Again, his is the only gospel to include this priceless passage. Now, if we can hold these thoughts for a few moments, let's look briefly at the epistle. Legend has it that these are the very words which struck Martin Luther so profoundly that they and they alone launched the Reformation. Actually, it probably took more than just Luther, but it's still a great story and I have no trouble believing it. Here then is that very great but very minor prophet Habakkuk with words which our parish very well ought to hold and heed in the present, uh, what we might call what some might want to call in our parish this present winter of our discontent. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch and wait to see what he will say to me. Remember, we're in Advent, the season of hope and expectation, and waiting and patience are a major part of hope and expectation. I will watch and wait. Again, not bad advice for our parish at this time. And then God speaks. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The vision, as Thomas no doubt discovered, is the faith to see the truth, capital T, and to see the truth clearly. Further, Habakkuk, as with Thomas, had no doubt pondered such truth in his mind and heart for a very long time. So God continues, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, meaning that the soul or even the parish which is haughty, proud, and lifted up will fail to receive this vision. Nevertheless, the just, Thomas, Luther, Habakkuk, our parish, shall live by faith. So this ability to wait, to be patient, to examine one's life not just in the present, but to look back over it to see when and where God has put his hand into and out of one's life remains a major factor which separates Thomas' faith from his more reckless but nevertheless charming cohort, Peter. The more we can look back over our life, the more we can detect how providence has not abandoned us, and then the more we can wait for future visions and revelations. Thomas had understood this, otherwise he never would have been able to make that statement, let us also go that we may die with him. Shifting gears again, let's look at the collect. Almighty and ever-living God, who for the greater confirmation of the faith did suffer thy servant Thy, thy apostle Thomas, did suffer thy apostle Thomas to be doubtful in thy son's resurrection. So what is this? For the greater confirmation of the faith. And what about God causing Thomas to doubt? Well, let's take that one first. Why would God cause anyone to doubt? Very simply, because not all doubt is bad. It's one thing to remain so butt-headed that we block out any and all possibility of receiving that vision which Habakkuk calls faith. But then there's another type of doubt which remains indispensable to faith. The gospel passage tells us that Thomas wasn't there when the Lord first appeared to the disciples, so where was he? 
Were his priorities out of whack? Had he gone fishing? Was he married to a shrew of a wife who was sick and tired of him running around with this strange group of buddies? Uh, well, whatever he had been doing, it really doesn't matter one iota, because the point simply remains that he wasn't there. Uh, but neither are a number of other important people there as well. Pilate wasn't there. Neither was Caiaphas, or the chief priests. You and I weren't there. In this way, John indicates that his story is for everyone who was elsewhere and not there. That is, Thomas represents each of us, not to mention every Christian who has ever lived. He is our stand-in. And his so-called doubt is nothing serious at all. What I mean is that Thomas doubting is anything but a refusal to believe. Indeed, it steams, stems from a rather healthy skepticism. And it's this healthy skepticism which the collect states God caused Thomas to have. Indeed, which he causes just about every thinking Christian to have. Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in the marks of the nails and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, in the words of William Temple, the great Archbishop of Canterbury back in the 1940s, in his wonderful book, Readings in St. John's Gospel, Temple writes, such vigor of disbelief plainly represents a strong urge to believe held down by common sense and its habitual dread of disillusionment. The point is that Thomas wanted to believe. He may have been a doubter, but his doubting proceeded from, a, from that healthy uh, type of skepticism, which hopefully all of us have from time to time. He wanted to believe. You know, faith is the opposite of doubt. And just as we cannot have light without darkness, we can never have any kind of serious faith without this good, healthy skepticism or sense of doubt. Thus, when the proper moment came a week later, Thomas in no way needed to examine crudely his Lord. Rather, he fell to his knees and worshiped him. Further on that occasion, when Thomas did recognize his Lord and Master, he didn't just say, oh, gee golly, it's you after all, welcome back from the dead. Rather, he fell on his knees and said, my God, my, my Lord and my God. Not just Lord or Master, but God. The God who causes the earth to tremble and shake. The God who rides upon the cherubim, flying upon the wings of the wind. This is what the collect means with those words, for the greater confirmation of the faith, my Lord and my God. As far as John's gospel is concerned, none other than doubting Thomas makes the first confession of Christian faith. And later this week at Christmas, we will read the first chapter of John with those glorious words, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. John begins his wonderful gospel with that wondrous prologue, and now it has come full circle, my Lord and my God. And now to attempt to wrap this up, and forgive me for getting personal for a few moments. Next Sunday, and I'm sorry she's not here today, she's under the weather. Next Sunday, Kathy and I will celebrate our 45th wedding anniversary. And next month, we'll observe the 40th anniversary of my ordination to the priesthood. And poor Kathy had not the slightest idea that when, when we married, that she'd end up the wife of a clergyman. Of course, she's far more than that, an outstanding teacher, musician, and mother in her own right. And to say the least, it's been quite a roller coaster ride. Lots of light and more than a fair share of dark. Yet through those not infrequent times, which we thought were relatively tough, if not catastrophic, even those moments seem to have happened for a reason. And throughout those times, our life has become greater, if not better, and far more satisfying than we would ever have expected. Of course, any couple married for any serious span knows this uh, just as well as I do, if not better. Further, God has become more real, even throughout this particular year of our own personal sicknesses, pain, and plague. And you all, St. Thomas, have genuinely helped Kathy and me see that. 
As I said earlier, I believe it's through this process of looking back over one's life, something many of us don't do often enough, that God becomes more real. Gratitude deepens, or maybe it's that gratitude prompts our minds and hearts to think back, to see the hills and valleys he's led us up over and through. Perhaps the order doesn't matter at all, as long as we manage to do it from time to time. And in doing so, God has become more real for millions, just as with Thomas, and just as with Thomas, their faith has become more real. Perhaps today, as we give thanks not only for the Apostle Thomas, but also for this parish which bears his name, we can derive a measure of strength by looking back. Time does not exist solely in the present. It exists in past and future as well. And at present, as I said earlier, some might say that Thomas is stuck in a deep valley. Uh, Perhaps it is the winter of our discontent. But as I said a few weeks ago, mountaintop experiences are called just that because they happen most often in the valleys or in the deserts of our lives. And as T.S. Eliot writes, if all time is present, then all time is unredeemable. If all time is present, no time is redeemable. Today, I ask that we remember that phrase, as well as the phrase for the collect, from the collect, for the greater confirmation of the faith, and that God caused Thomas to doubt in a good way. There can be no light for us without darkness. And we need our best to do our best to remember that although December 21st may very well be the shortest and darkest day of the year, nevertheless, and let us never forget what a great word nevertheless is, nevertheless, beginning on the 22nd, the day, our days, begin to grow longer and brighter. And there's absolutely no reason on God's green earth why we can't apply that same principle or thought to our parish. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. We sinners do beseech thee to hear us, O Lord God, and that it may please thee to rule and govern thy holy church, universal in the right way. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee so to rule the hearts of thy servants, the President of the United States, the President-elect, and the Governor of this state, that they may above all things seek thy honor and glory. 
We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to illuminate all bishops, priests, and deacons with true knowledge and understanding of thy word, that both by their preaching and living they may set it forth and show it accordingly. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to give to all nations unity, peace, and concord. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to succor, help, and comfort all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to grant that all thy servants departed in this life in thy faith and fear may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to give us true repentance, to forgive us all our sins, negligences, and ignorances, and to imbue us with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, to amend our lives according to thy holy word. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. The almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You all deserve a medal for coming out this morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will have evening prayer this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. And please don't forget to RSVP for Christmas Eve. 7.30 and 10 if you haven't already. And we will have the Blue Christmas service at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, Susan Gage will preside and preach. And uh, we all look forward to, to her ministry there. While we have time, let us do good unto all men, and especially unto them that are of the household of faith. After the service, we turn to the time of the Christmas. So able, able by and please stand by. Oh, thank you. Does anybody else have, a, have any announcement? Thank you.
As we celebrate the Holy Communion this morning, we continue to pray for Beth Mithen, Beth Mithen and her continued convalescence. And Bishop Logue has asked us to pray for Father Al Crumpton and his mother, his mother recovering favorably from COVID. And also for Father Stan White, the rector of the Church of the King in Valdosta, um, who is now under hospice care. We pray for him, his family, his parish. And let us give thanks for our parish, her leaders, her benefactors, not only in terms of money, but in terms of grace, asking God to sustain us with his grace, presence, faith, hope, and charity. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God. Because thou didst send Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son, to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father. For that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others, 
who shall be partakers of this Holy Communion, may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the promise of thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members incorporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. O God, most glorious, most bountiful, except we humbly beseech thee our praises and thanksgivings for thy holy Catholic Church, the mother of us all who bear the name of Christ, and most especially today for thy parish, named in honor of the Apostle Thomas. For the faith our parish hath conveyed in safety to our time, and for the mercies by which she hath enlarged and comforted the souls of men, for the virtues which she hath confirmed upon earth, and for the holy lives by which she continues to glorify both the world and thee, to whom one blessed Trinity be ascribed all honor, might, majesty, and dominion, now and forever. Amen. Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. <clears throat> say come, and let everyone that heareth say come, amen. Even so, quickly, come, Lord Jesus. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.